just brought up a moment ago. <laughs> uh, and I'm so glad we, 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 we're not having any of that being aired <laughs> I anywhere. I think the first podcast should be blackface or not blackface. Oh, come on. <laughs> we'll you get know, some hits. I mean, some know, little hits. <laughs> part, part of this um, is uh, this podcast is probably one of the most dangerous podcasts <laughs> out there. I'm pretty sure that's a, that's a fact, and I'm the one who's in danger. So... Let me say, um, is it okay to pick on transgender kids? Okay. <laughs> and now, you know, and the pro and con, and we'll sort of divide up and pay that. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Got Therapy. You know, the Got Therapy podcast has been going on for so long. and it used uh, to have a video, so technically it was a vidcast. That's exactly podcast. what it was. But we, we're, we're changing the past mm -hmm. as we speak, so... Uh, Get, get ready the past. for that. You speak. that is, that's called apricou in a Freudian. That, that, there's a Freudian concept for change in the past. Oh, that sounds like a topic. Apricou, right yeah, it's very interesting. All right, so, uh, yeah. All right, put that on the list of things to get back Talk to because it. I think those are um, – Kind of, kind of interesting topics. Now, at some point, we'll probably you're moving the headphones over there. We'll probably mm. wear some headphones uh, like when we do it. So we want like to measure that audio. That now, cover my face. I've been told I have the uh, <laughs> I have a face for not radio. I have a face for I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, a helmet. I thought of a hel <laughs> maybe a reverse <laughs> helmet uh, in some That's way it, too, yeah, yeah. so that we can uh, figure out how to <laughs> not shock the uh, people who may have a chance to watch mm. this. All right, well, thanks for being here, man. How are you? What's going on in your world? Dr. I, Dan Rose, ladies well, and gentlemen. Well, what's good, it's good. It's, I, you know, I, um, I've spent a lot of time uh, straightening my beard. Uh, okay. To, uh, <laughs> well, to go for. Uh, you know, I remember, I don't know how many minutes out of every podcast we had to devote to your beard. Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> and it's the, an important thing. And the thing that you put on it, which I never really That's understood. Right. I, I use, I use Where the diamond was oil. It's a good, it's a you, uh, beard cream. Actually, you mentioned the beard thing because yeah. uh, well, my, my son's been having some medical issues. And, um, oh, it's already here. One man. of these things is he's, he's, he's been having lots of stomach aches. So we went to go visit okay. um, Dr. Ali. Very nice guy, by the way. I okay. Anybody, Dr. Ali, he's a good, good guy. All right, sounds but, good. Um, he, he noticed that my son is 12, and he said, well, you know, he really hasn't started hit, hitting pu puberty yet. You know? Right, okay. And okay. Uh, I'm, I thought to myself, I hit puberty late. You know, and yeah. So this beard, I mean, it was about last week, sometime, well, wasn't it, or something actually, like that? But I'm not there's sure. This thing is emotional puberty. I'm never going to get there. But, um, <laughs> and I, when my okay. son was born, 12 years ago, I could not grow a beard. I tried. It was a sort of a mangy kind of thing. Okay. Okay. And then one day, like about six years into it, I just, I just sort of sat down and went, and then suddenly. Wow! Like, so you had to strain like strain that. That, then, that reminds me of other things, but I I don't know <laughs> why you would necessarily equate your straining with well, beard popping really, out. I had to your... focus you know, and it just sort of just sort of happened. All right, yeah. I I don't know where to go in the next step in that story right there, but there really uh, is your beard just, your beard I, is um, almost a, a, a another person on this uh, it this is. podcast. It is. If my sometimes. beard could talk. If you're being <laughs> talk, that is wrong in so many ways. It is, it is. All right, so, um, yeah, like so I will well, ask you, how's your son? I mean, he's okay? We, well, we're well, working we're on him? Sure. Right? It, 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 you know, we, we, he's, he's been diagnosed with some heart stuff. We're trying oh, to figure right. out um, what, what that is, and um, oh. the, we're doing some testing. So um, at this point, um, you know, I think everything he's, I always think he's just faking. Right. But apparently right. the echogram and the MRI okay, and six or seven doctors seem to <laughs> still holding out for the fact that this kid is just doing this to test me. Well, it's all, <laughs> somehow it turns around to be all about you. But on it the is, other hand, um, I'm hoping, I hope he's going to be okay. I'm sure. We'll, well, I uh, told him if he doesn't thoughts. straighten up, I'm going to beat this out of him. I said, this well, arrhythmia, <laughs> I think I can, you know, I'll show you. Okay. Uh, the parenting courses, uh, they're, not, they're not working out so well. I, see, I, I, I think I'm, we talked about this in an earlier podcast. And I, I think that um, the, one, um, the one element that I've used to, to a great deal in, in being able to raise my son is shame. I think that okay. is, yeah. it's called, I'm going to write a book, Shame-Based Parenting. Shame-based parenting. That, yes. that one's been used throughout the centuries. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, it. I don't think you have to write the book. I think everybody knows that one already. Well, I, uh, Maybe the how not to. Yeah, uh, I've perfected it, you know. I am, uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, it's... Uh, well, I'm, I hope everything works out um, for the best for your son. And, uh, you know, you, but you, on the other hand, are still working. 
at Columbus State well, University. Well, someone would argue whether what I do is actually working. <laughs> no one's but absolutely I, been I able to. I show up, and the taxpayers are actually paying my paycheck. So. There, there is no evidence whatsoever uh, to that actually occurring at any point right, in time. All I know is taxpayer money is, is flowing toward me in a way that probably at some point someone's going to notice. All right, so um, I, I don't know what to make of that, but uh, in, uh, we're happy to have you here today mm -hmm. so um could i you drink know, is this okay yeah okay, sure so sure that's fine and uh yeah that's right we're we're no longer at the university you know we've done a lot of podcasting and video casting About four years i think a bunch of it yeah, <laughs> yeah. even more uh in some cases so <laughs> yeah. um but now we're in a, in a private studio so nice. we're we're putting some things together yeah. it's good to have you back in here and mm -hmm. you know got therapy's been a show where we have really um talked about all things mental health and uh those kind of things mm -hmm. are always of interest and you know how people respond to others and what goes on in their lives yeah. and uh that's what we uh, want to look at so so i'm sure that you no doubt if you can get that adhd under control <laughs> have found a topic or two for us I to talk about today well, you, you sort of think we, talk, we should talk about now uh, there is a, there is a concept out there called fomo Okay. Uh, but, but, but the, and that, that's been done. And FOMO is a fear of missing out. It's, folks are literally, uh, th there's a compulsion, almost an addiction. Fear of missing out. Right. FOMO. Okay, I got you. And, and so All we right. notice as, as, um, as we become increasingly more wired and interconnected, you are far more aware of things that you're not doing. And social media, especially Facebook, can generate a feeling called FOMO. Okay. So the minute, and, and this has happened to me, I think I told this story once. When right. I was younger, I said I always wanted to buy a house, and I wanted to have a pool that I could sit next to the pool and read a book. I okay. don't like swimming in the pool. Water makes me nervous. Right. But I want to just sit next to the pool. And okay. so there I am. I, I now now have that house. It's got a pool. I'm sitting there, and I'm reading. Okay. But... Dream come true. I, well, you would think so. But then I, I turn on my phone. One of them, I got one of them smartphones. You got one of the smartphones? Uh, is I saw your phone. Is that, You had to flip it, and there's a crank <laughs> on it. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. Uh, Mine has a cord, and it's... But, <laughs> the so antenna. I turn this thing on. I look, and I go, turn on the Facebooks. Yeah. You got one of those Facebooks? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, so I got, <laughs> I got, got on the Facebooks. And the minute you do that, you realize that there are people doing cooler things than you. I got this friend named Ian who it, it was like in like, you know, like um, Sweden or something, you know? Right, There's a, right. You know, picture of him there cavorting with naked Swedish people. And I'm like, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm like... On, on a fjord. <laughs> that's right, yeah, that's, don't, don't so talk dirty. I'm sure. yeah, so, right. so I, that relax, so at the, for that brief moment, I am sucked away from the very dream that I've uh, that I've worked hard to attain, and right. suddenly I'm feeling envy. I'm feeling I'm missing something, and this is a chronic condition. In, okay. in this age of being wired and interconnectedness and social media, we are often it is pervasive. We, we are hounded by this feeling of we could be doing something else, and now we're that we're missing something. It it it, it does seem to me that this is pervasive, and that oh. all of us have it, and all of a sudden we have it, whereas. We didn't have it back uh, some time ago. Is this about social media? Is this about that internet we, you know, we hear, um, or the interweb think, we hear about? I think that, that there's a it, he's the uh, physicist. Uh, what's his name? Um, Asian dude, the physicist. I can't think of his name, but he has. I think it's him who had a theory that um, civilizations progress in stages, and um, we are now we've suddenly hit a stage of rapid technological ac acceleration that is uh, characterized by interconnectedness so now it's not just a connection to your um, family or your community but now the internet allows us to be connected and for information to move across nations wow. and so he says that this is the beginning of something and if you ever watch star trek there's a, um that there, there is this this notion that suddenly there becomes a federation where all these different races and people are part of one giant thing mm -hmm. and uh, he says this is what we're beginning to see right. so i think when you say we didn't have that back in the old days, and the old days we didn't have it like twenty—I don't know how long Facebook's been around—but it's probably been about twenty years before this really caught on, right? Right. right. Um, the thing, our, our smartphones were literally something you'd see on Star Trek. These are not; these devices have, you know. So no, I remember we talked about the the guys who went to the moon, and we have more computer power in right. our phones than By we walking have. around. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, the thing. Yeah. Well, even in the course of having these, like. I remember when a terabyte of information cost you like four thousand dollars. Like I remember, I'm like, ah. and now for like 
10 bucks, you can have a terabyte that fits in the palm of your hand. Right. This is, is it terabyte or? Yeah, it's a terabyte. It is terabyte. It's terabyte. And, and uh, you can lose those too. I've had those and they, I don't know where they're going. But yeah, anyway, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, same. yeah so can. all that information and, and also the connectedness between, um, between us uh, around the globe, actually. So you can build an audience. One person can have a very large audience. Like, right, before there's now. a possibility that, that somewhere, somewhere in the future, someone in Kazakhstan is going to hear this. And yes. they're going to say things. Well, that's, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, that's the only place that we are actually uh, broadcasting to right yes. now. So that that's makes sense. Cousin. That's got a cousin. Actually, there's a guy in Kazakhstan saying, you know what? That's a first world country? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> I mean, that's really what's going to happen. But well, yeah, and all of that is happening so quickly. And I don't, it's like a lot of other things that we've talked about over time, and that is we're not prepared for what is happening in those situations. We're, we haven't had time to catch up. Well, our nervous system was built around. Uh, you know the uh, the arid plains. Uh, we, we we have a nervous system that was built to do a certain thing, and now we've generated these technologies. And think of think of the earliest technologies we had: a spear, for instance. Right. right. And now we've gone from something that is in some ways uh, accentuates um, our our earliest wiring to something that now begins to um, to take the place of to. And so you're right. We are moving in a pace that our our um, our psyches. Our uh, our nervous system are, is attempting to catch up, and I think that you know there yeah, may. Yeah, if I interrupt, you you yeah. had a famous quote I remember uh, from one of your. Uh, yeah. um, was this uh, one about French, French philosophers? But no, it was no, not. No, no. As a matter of fact, it was about a crisis, that a crisis arises mm -hmm. before we've had a chance to That's create right. it. Yes. Is that what that, you that, said? Yeah, trauma is something that arrives before you have a chance to create it. In a way, that is exactly what happens. I think Facebook affords a certain trauma, and um, there is in that that's where there's a sort of a second term here, and it's one that I'm beginning to hear more of, and that is not FOMO but JOMO. JOMO. Okay, I was just getting the first one down. So okay, well, what is this? If, if FOMO about? is the fear of missing out, JOMO is the joy of missing. out. Oh, so there is okay. A Something's been turned here. We're yeah, getting. I, the, uh, I think we're now beginning to sense that there is. Um, you can see often memes of folks, Netflix and chill, for instance. Yes. These are all a, a, an ode to being able to step away from the flow of social media and this interconnectedness. And, uh, and it's, it's a form of recoil, I think. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing, that we've, we wanted to be connected. We wanted to be involved. Everybody wants all this information. We want to be on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and those social media platforms. But now, now that we're there, wait a second. What's happened to make people kind of pull back from this? Because I find that sort of a natural reaction to it. Well, you just, there's just one of my, I've been listening to this guy, or listening, he's, he's dead. There's a, a philosopher and a Friedrich Hegel, you know? Yes. And um, um, he and he invented pop tarts. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, that's didn't that's it. The, the other idea. <laughs> nothing to do. Yeah, yeah. I always said nothing to do with pop tarts. But he talks about how that there is um, there is a dialectic and there is a movement and there's a movement of the spirit of the age, and that each age has its own distinct spirit, and so the zeitgeist, as it were. Right. And if our current zeitgeist is sort of defined by this interconnectedness. Then, then we'll we'll see it move, and there'll be this dialectic. It'll it'll there'll be a, 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 um, um, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis as there's some sort of movement of information, and that the possibility of a mind that could grow. Uh, when I think of um, there's this concept of digital natives, for instance, like my right. son is a digital native. Like I can mm -hmm. literally tell him stories that you know we played outside because we didn't have a computer. You know, right. and he's like, you know, what sort of weird place wow. did you come from? <laughs> Where's the? Uh... How, how did that? Uh, wait, you played outside? So, oh yeah. yeah. See, and, and the thing about you know, it wasn't the toys you get; it was the boxes. It was those big boxes that you played in back in the day. The guy, what, yeah, that took up right. all you our know, time, you know. Time. But yeah, so it's re-education. Uh, it's bringing back history for. Uh, you know, it, to him, it's like, it's, but out. he is a digital native, so the mind that is required for the new age doesn't require a Gutenberg mind which is what you and I have. Okay. We grew up in a land of books. Information was shared. You shared another mind by someone writing something down and handing it to you. Or 
something uh, there was, certainly we had media we had TV and all that sort of stuff but still it was it was the uh, the zeitgeist was the Gutenberg mind but now we live in a world of the interconnected the digital mind it's a different thing yeah and it's so <laughs> fast everything happens so fast so if there's a trauma somewhere it's everywhere now so you begin to pick up on it has an effect on you as an individual on the other hand we're it's uh, it's sort of good and bad news we have this <laughs> ability to connect with people to build crowds build audience uh, if you've got something really positive positive to say, then uh, more people can hear it and almost uh, at a moment's notice, too. So. Yeah, I, f I find that I can share uh, m nude pictures with people far easier than I could before. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just not, you know. Yeah, if you haven't learned that lesson, we'll have that on another show <laughs> <see> because <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody needs to uh, kind of control what happens yeah. to, uh, Actually, with that camera. Actually, whenever I send nudes, somebody always replies, you should see a doctor about that. That's right. really all <laughs> right. I forget. <laughs> That looks infected. That's really <laughs> that's, all. I, that's all I ever get. Okay. <laughs> all right, but but uh, so it's having an effect on it. And no, so are you saying the JOMO the mm -hmm. is pulling back from it? So I want my personal space. Does that mean we cut off the social media? We close the phone down? We go off of uh, social media? Well, I think if 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 the battle cry of JOMO is Netflix and chill, in some way it may be simply a retreat into another form of media. Or it could be a, um, a momentary retreat from said thing. I will say that there are all these folks who talk about, um, you'll see this with some mental health experts, this notion of taking a, a Facebook vacation right. where you literally sort of, you know, unplug. Um, I wonder, though, I wonder if the folks who are doing that are those more with a Gutenberg mind. I mean, right. if they're, you know, whereas... Uh, it's interesting because my, uh, my son, uh, for them... Um, a big form of communication is is not books but memes. All right. So whether it what it what is what is Twitter, or uh, Snapchat or memes, you convey information in these bite-sized nuggets, usually laced with irony. In his case, irony and sarcasm. Right. And there's something interesting about that. Now, what how that connects with Jomo, I'm not sure, but uh, it could be a way to. Um, um, those of us who find ourselves lost to Facebook, maybe there's a natural break that comes with someone in his generation where they, they literally uh, can save themselves by being pulled into and drowned in envy by just taking nothing serious. I mean, there's a price to pay for that, too. I don't right, know. right. It, 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 there there may, may well be. I, I was thinking of Nicholas Carr's book on the, the shallows where we the Internet sort of changed our brain to some extent. Mm -hmm. It's his thesis, the idea that uh, we're all, uh, instead of reading the full book, mm -hmm. reading the entire article, we skim it. We get little pieces of that. Then it comes down to something on Facebook. Then it comes down to Instagram, then mm -hmm. Twitter, and it's under 40 characters. And, and every, everything seems to be a soundbite now. I'm not sure where that's taking us. Well, you know, it's funny because I don't know if his car said that, but those who are sort of proponents of this sort of movement would say, well, why not? Because we now, um, you now have at your fingertips all this information. Why hold on to it? Right. You know, why, you know, if the spear was a wonderful invention, one of our earliest technology, why would you go back to having to kill something with your hands? Absolutely. Uh, I, that, it's really interesting, too, because I think part of this thesis is <clears throat> really what about uh, the values? I mean, you can, we've had this whole phenomenon of fake news, as we all kind of know about that now. Uh, <clears throat> and and what is the truth? What? How do you uh, disseminate what is actually uh, true with the things that we see. Is that fake? You know, they have this uh, deep fake thing now where they can take your video and they may take this video of you I right now as we're, as we're looking and put somebody else's face on it or make you say something uh, and use your words mm -hmm. then it's, your, your voice to say mm -hmm. something completely different than you actually mm -hmm. have said. So I guess uh, the bigger point is that how do we no. How do we get this critical thinking up to a you point? You that deep to, fake thing. I, I've been, uh, you know, I've been watching nothing but um, uh, adult videos where everybody's face is Steve Buscemi's. It's deep fake. Okay, I'm and gonna. Um, <laughs> and I. <laughs> I'm gonna let you know. Sometimes with this uh, stuff, you've seen this over the, over the years, but we just settle. We let it settle down, and the dust comes down, and then we go on to something different. But just saying uh, that, that that'll yeah, things but too. but the, all right. But the point being that mm -hmm. there is um, uh, 
it's getting harder to tell. And who's influencing who? And is it the right thing? And how do we, what are about values? What's the right thing? You know, recently um, there's, and this is in the last few days or week, uh, Facebook and those folks, Twitter and so forth, have been taking people down because mm -hmm. of uh, hate speech and, and language and, and those kinds of things. I, I just wonder what you think about that as well in this scenario. Well, it's talking. interesting because there, there's this wonderful, uh, I saw this on the Facebooks, someone posted a beam and it's a picture of two guys and they're standing across from a, a number and it's a big number written in the sand and one of them says, it's a nine, the other says it's a six. Oh. <laughs> and then it says down below, it says, you know, you really need to think about other people's perspective because, you know, you want to know where they're coming from and all this sort of stuff. Right. And then that sounds innocuous. It really does. Yeah. However, whoever wrote that in the sand meant it to be a six or a nine. It literally can't be both. It has to be one of right. those things. Right. And so the, if you suddenly generate a space where all narratives are equally considered and all truths are necessarily important. I've often heard uh, in New Age um, worldview that, you know, everyone has to, to define their own truth. Well, then it isn't a truth. A truth on some level has to be universal. And so the worry, I think, is when you say these sorts of things is that um, we could lose the possibility of any sort of narrative to bind at all. And the only narrative that you might come up with is one that's raced, laced in irony. So it's a distancing. Like when I hear my son talk about things, it's a way of avoiding the possibility of any sort of emotional or spiritual investment and so that you can hover above everything in this sort of meta-narrative that's an ironic tone. So when you, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's a potential problem. Well, it's, uh, there's a lot going on with, with this information age we're in and, and uh, misinformation mm -hmm. age a, as well. Um, but people are getting very sophisticated in getting a fake message out or um, manipulating others and influencing others uh, in this way. And I think our government obviously is uh, aware of it and what they're doing about it. And I'm not really, really sure it gets into political issues and elections and other kinds of things. So I think there's a lot to consider in this. But um, are we just moving to a point where we can't believe anything that comes out? Or we question everything and what do we really know? Well, maybe this is the... the, the it certainly will be a uh, uh, something that uh, my son's generation will have to face. If you are flooded with information, if if you have at your fingertips all sorts of knowledge, you're going to have to develop the sort of mind to parse it. You're going to have right. to develop a, a mind that can make the right sort of sense of things. That makes sense. And I think in our current political discourse, that's often both the left and the right take advantage of, um, uh, uh, they can generate a narrative that... Um, that isn't focused necessarily on a solution. Um, a good, wonderful example right now are some of the controversy over some of the abortion bills that are being uh, floated and uh, in our state of Georgia and Alabama especially. And it, 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 um, there is such a disconnect between both sides of this issue. Right. And if the goal were for both sides, for instance, that we were to decrease the number of abortions, if that were a goal, then both might agree on it, and then we would set toward being able to, how do we do this? Right. And if the concession, well, we have to make abortion safe and legal so that we can't do away with this, but let's then do this, then you have the possibility of being able to generate um, uh, the possibility for, for some sort of change or movement. And I think in a lot of mm -hmm. politi political discourse, there isn't anything like that. There, it's simply a matter of who shouts loudest. It's a, it's a right. zero sum game. Why? Well, and um, and uh, I I hadn't heard the word uh, tribalism used in in the way it's being used these days. So it's just one of those uh, automatic things. And so what 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 it becomes now is which group are you in? And um, it, it almost seems to me like we're not really thinking should we be in this group and what what are the consequences of being in this group? Yeah. And like, I mean, I, let's just say that by accident I joined ISIS. Now, it's taken me a while to, you know, because I didn't realize it's a little like those. You uh, know, <laughs> out of all the things I've heard that uh, some reason well, it sends a chill up well, uh, my It's spine a little like, a little you know, when you, when you were a kid and you joined one of those record club things and they keep sending you records? Yeah. And you yeah. can never get out of? That's what's like joining ISIS. Gym, gym membership kind That's of right. thing, yes. Once you join, it's really hard to get you to, to stop. They keep sending me brochures, <laughs> you know. But 
Um, I'm not sure I was going with that, but just I'm no but, longer. Uh, I, I, first of all, I'm thinking of a, a brochure from ISIS. Um, <laughs> yes, you know, I'm not sure that. what to make. Can you say that 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 was a lovely setting for a beheading? I'm gonna say <laughs> I really yeah. like. So you're coming up with a jingle <laughs> for That's right. uh, ISIS you know, brochure. Fine. Okay, but what were we talking about again? It was beheadings. Was it? Okay. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, no, but uh, the, 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 it, we find ourselves there. We're in, in this tribalism kind of thing where we're moving um, uh, from group to group. And, and um, I think it's just too easy to take a side and stick with it or buy an, an ideology that maybe you shouldn't be in. Maybe it doesn't fit with who you are and what, what's going on, but it feels good to be in a group, all right? Well, when you mentioned that, because I, I was sort of joking about the ISIS thing, because who am I kidding? They wouldn't let me let me join. <laughs> if, yeah. I wouldn't want to be. A I know for a group. fact that you would fail the admission. To, uh, <laughs> any that, any no group doubt. that would accept me is really not a group. I right, would be a part of. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, the idea, like, like there, 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 there were like uh, uh, there were thousands of folks who who were American mm. citizens who joined ISIS. Right, and part of what ISIS they offer you a certainty. They offer you a clear narrative, and in a way, uh, it's not, um, it's an answer to FOMO, and fundamentalism and tribalism can be a reflexive answer to FOMO, and, and it's an answer we've been giving for most of our history, I imagine, but right now it may seem even more pertinent, and there are variants of ISIS. I think that our political tribalisms are, are a variant of that. Mm -hmm. There's a famous quote by the philosopher Slavoj Žižek. Um, mm -hmm. Who I uh, like to quote a lot. Yes. Um, and um, nothing here on the show uh, so different than the other times we've so right, about Zizak. Right. Well, well, Zizak would say that you know, you'll notice that there's never been an Amish terrorist. They just don't do it. Okay, I don't have. A, I'm thinking. I'm, go, I'm going not, through my. And you may say, well, that's because, like, well, you know, like, what are they going to run over you with a, you know, <laughs> a horse? A cart? horse and buggy, right? Right. But no, 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 no. The point would be is is that true fundamentalism is 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 a certainty that if nothing else it just makes you feel sorry for the other guy. There's no you know there's no so what tribalism some of our political tribalisms um, ISIS all these sorts of things offer a um, a symptomatic and I mean symptom in a mental health sort of way a way to answer the FOMO. And it is not a real answer. Right. No Doesn't more than developing sense. a heroin addict, a herring addiction is, is an answer to the fundamental ontological concerns you may have. Right. And But the Amish or um, um, the Dalai Lama or a, you can think of all sorts of um, religious organizations where – they're not blowing things up because they don't. Their narrative is such that it it doesn't. Um, it affords on some level an answer that is both comforting, real, and has utility, and it keeps them from having to. There's no reason to blow anyone up. Right, right. <clears throat> so it's buying into this ideology, um, religious or otherwise ideology. I'm I'm kind of curious about the FOMO stuff because you were saying that's a fear of missing out, but in fear. Uh, isn't this about anxiety of not being a part of a group or some uh, level of anxiety for the person? And, and would that lead to if, the treatment for that? Well, you, you can think of two levels of anxiety. There's there's ontic and ontological anxiety. Okay, you're going to have to run those okay, by me. Okay, so one an more ontic time. is like the sort of thing, like if you have a fear of, uh, if a dog bit you when you were three and now you have a fear of dogs. Got it. So ontic anxiety is, is, is much more... Um, a reflection of your own developmental experience, your everyday experience. So um, we can develop. I, I uh, used to fly all the time, and then when I flew here to interview for this job at CSU, there was a really bad storm, and ever since then I've been a little nervous of flying. So that is an ontic anxiety, you know? Okay, it's I like, got you know, it. Um, um, I have a story about, you know, how I'm afraid of nudity, but that's a different thing. <laughs> I'll save that for a different... But ontological anxiety is... Much more. Um, it is. It is much more existential. It is. It is a basic element of the human condition, and that is the very anxiety of existing. Death is an ontological anxiety. 
Yes. Yeah, so where does that fit with the FOMO? I mean, I, I, all I'm doing is I'm online, um, uh, and there I see something, your uh-huh. example of you're seeing your friend having a much better time than right. you, and there you are in perfect circumstances, by the pool, by reading the, the pool, book. I mean, not wearing pants. I mean, this literally <laughs> is everything I hoped and dreamed. I don't know about the pants. Put the <laughs> pants back on. That's where I'm going with that. But uh, uh, yeah. so, but it interferes fence, with you. Nobody can see. So uh, is, it, is it some mechanism that uh, we have to be aware of so that we're not losing every time we see someone else doing something more fun or well th- and this, this could be the mental health takeaway from this this, this could be if, 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 if we need to have a, a bit of self-help to this to yeah. to think about this is that if we think about those two levels of anxiety in some ways that th- th- they, they really coincide what may be happening when I'm sitting there at the pool is um, our nervous systems attempt to be able to generate a um, what's called the euthymic window. And we try huh? to be able to maintain a certain level of balance where you're not feeling too much or too little. And so you're, you're, you're trying, based on your genetic uh, um, uh, loading and uh, your developmental history, our euthymic windows can be both in context they can be broader and narrow. So folks who okay. are, quote, happy may have a broader euthymic window. Okay. But even as I'm sitting there by the pool, I'm having to navigate and, and mediate hunger, the uh, need for elimination, um, um, all sorts of biological process that, that directly and indirectly affect my psyche. And so we are always attempting to be able to maintain our, our our equilibrium within that euthymic window so even as i'm sitting there the reason i picked the phone up may have been an attempt at some sort of balancing okay, right? okay. so the goal would be is how do we and this is maybe something we can talk about in, in depth at another place because something sure. really interests me the difference between emotional regulation and emotional modulation ah okay emotional regulation um heroin cutting um restricting food intake those are all forms of emotional regulation they right. regulate emotion a healthy response is modulation so what if while i'm sitting there at the pool i attempt to regulate by grabbing my phone and going on fa- facebook i'm distracting myself from both my internal and my external surround in such a way that i'm not necessarily directly dealing with the things that i could deal with in the most healthy way a modulation right. Uh, as opposed to a regulatory activity, could be to simply take a breath and start to 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 name and allow myself to experience in the moment the things that are going on, to listen to the sound of the pool, think about the sun as it hits me, to be able to look at my house and my pool, to think about where I've been, where I'm at, where I'm going. Those are moments of meeting with the here and now. It's a meeting with the now that... <clears throat> you can find only in an act of modulation and it, they're often missing in an act of regulation does that make sense yeah i like it too the idea of modulation in music sometimes you you're still in the same song mm-hmm. you just modulate to another key mm-hmm. so the verse and everything else mm-hmm. course mm-hmm. goes along and with you it. don't so suddenly that's an interesting have to, concept. To, to to change and, and with that act of modulation it requires an immersion and a connection with the now and there's another concept that maybe we could talk about another time. I think it's really interesting, and it's called emotional granularity. And that often when we're in a, in a, in a, when we're regulating an emotion, for instance, if you're cutting, for instance, if what you're attempting to regulate is a is an anxiety with a capital A. But when you're in a modulatory act, you can begin to granulate, and you can think about the complexity of the emotion you're experiencing. And you can it's sort of like in music, it's the difference between the Ramones and Beethoven. One of them is broad, and it is blaring, and the other requires you to think, wait a minute, as opposed to just feeling anxiety, right now I have had a really long week, and I know the my way my character structure is, it is hard for me to hit the brake. When I'm anxious, I hit the gas. But I've been thinking a lot in my own personal life or in therapy or in whatever that I'm beginning to think about how I can be more sophisticated and healthy in my use of the brake. And then when I think about that, I generate a here and now granular moment where I think about the complexity of who I am and where I am. And that may allow me to be alive 
to have what's known as a lived moment okay. as opposed to something that I may be escaping from. So it's not just a f- as opposed to answering a fear of missing out by doing something, I can allow myself to drop into the moment and into the now. And that's a skill to learn. That's one of the things people learn in therapy. Right. I, I think, um, well, we, we certainly have talked about that a lot. And the idea and notion of mindfulness and being in the moment and probably being here as opposed to wherever else your thoughts may be. Um, but I think it's, it's a, it, it is a skill to learn and don't we need that. I mean, there needs to be more of that. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really wondering, are people you see really tuned in to, um, in some novel I was reading, talking about um, situational awareness, mm-hmm. like uh, in that moment of situational awareness, you kind of uh, knowing where other people are, what's mm-hmm. going on, where you are, how you're moving, mm-hmm. and, and so forth, which I think is, uh, it's kind of a, a side uh, definition of this mindfulness idea, sort of a sit rep, if they say in the military. A sit rep. <laughs> Don't ask me. That, uh, that, <laughs> See that because like I, 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 I hesitate uh, to uh, okay. go there because it could be used in a dangerous way. So uh, <laughs> I'll think about how to. I do. But I, uh, all right. So are are people aware? Um, that's a broad question, but I mean, really, are the people around you, the people that you see, certainly when you you come up to someone and start mm-hmm. talking to them, their focus mm-hmm. is on you, but are you looking around seeing people really mm-hmm. being aware of the moment to moment scenarios? Well, I, I, I use an example that, um, that um, happened recently. I was in one of these um, CSU training things where we're going and we're, we're all uh, we're all in University speech. training. I remember that. <laughs> yes, go yes, ahead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, you, you missed this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, and so we go in and... Um, I get there, and we're, we were all assigned places to seat, so I don't really know a lot of the folks at my table. And as I go and I sit down, I sit down, and I realize that all the other tables, people are talking, and they seem to be having a good time, and I'm aware that, wait a minute, I'm not talking to anybody. I feel kind of, I feel sort of lonely and detached, and I'm disconnected, and I'm like, you know, and then, I, and then my mind begins to try to do something with his feelings, so the emotion rises up, and then I begin to generate various narratives. Well, maybe that's because I got a bum table and people around me aren't good, or maybe it's me, I suck, maybe I've always been, I'm awkward, I'm weird. And so there's all these sorts of wow, things. Wow, you're really winding it up. So uh, I'm like really thinking about it. Yeah. And then I think to myself, wait a minute, hold on, let me take a breath, let me just lean into this. And I'm like, you're right, I am feeling this, and I'm a little tired. And, and then I realize that the reason my table isn't talking to me because I have my chair turned away from them. I literally have my back to them. And so, so, okay. Wait, let me see. All right, so you're in a large room with the round, the round table. The round so, you, and if you're facing the speaker, you have to put turn your back. And I had turned uh, my to, say, and so they're talking, and I'm like, why are they not talking to me? I, wait a minute. So I simply and utterly moved my ta- my chair till I'm facing them, and then we all start to talk. <laughs> but that's a wonderful example of how being in the moment and be allowing yourself and again one of my favorite cats on the planet Wilfred Beyond he always says the goal of therapy is not to stop suffering to get people to suffer better and if I had allowed to and by allowing myself to suffer a little better I am kind of lonely this does suck I can then come up with wait a minute I'm turned away from them <laughs> and then suddenly I am connected with them in a way and things move smoothly you know. All right, I'm gonna not I'm gonna, for them, by the way, because suddenly they have to deal with me. Yeah, then, their lives that, I was, are suddenly I, I was gonna and say uh, they probably wish you t- kept <laughs> that like, yes. chair turned away a little longer before <laughs> yeah, things okay, began yeah. to happen. But I totally, I totally get that. Well, it it is this critical thinking. It is awareness, and so people have to um, spend some time uh, with that. I mean, I, I think that's some of the goal of therapy too. Mm-hmm. I guess mm-hmm. uh, beyond is, is saying this. Uh, uh, similarly, I, what I'm trying to say is basically this 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 notion that you have um, a an awareness, and then you give yourself the option to choose and make things different, as opposed to running sort of with a with a thought process that just kind of leads you out, uh, to to maybe 
to where you don't want to go. For example, in social media, when you see those things up there and you see other people having this wonderful time, aren't those pictures of Instagram, everybody's having the best time well, in the world? I mean, how my, is that? I, my I've never had those wasn't that much time. showing the, you know, the, the, the stomach virus he may have picked up on this. It wasn't you know, him <laughs> laying in the, in the fetal position and going, yeah, oh, you won't believe what happened. So there is a selective thing. But yeah. there's also, and one of my, one of my, uh, there's a, a Melanie Klein, who's a famous, um, probably the uh, the mother of uh, object relations. She says that the only way through suffering is gratitude. And so, if there is the capacity, and and she sort of, she charts a progress that you have to first own your own envy, and she thinks envy is central to our existence, and that we are often angry and and full of envy and rage regarding the people around us and that if we um, if we can own that if we can name it then we have the possibility of being first um, being kind enough to ourselves to forgive ourselves for having such emotion right. and then we have the possibility of then being able to lean into others and then I could literally say to my friend you know Ian it's really cool that he's able to do these things. I know growing up with him, he always talked to me about how he wanted to travel. And for mm. him, this was really important. And just like I always wanted a pool to sit by, now mm -hmm. he gets to travel. Isn't it wonderful that both of us have been able to move forward in our life and do these things? Yeah, it, it seems that we don't appreciate at times because we're overwhelmed by this anxiety or uh, not fitting in or someone's got something as a better situation and things are happening. So uh, it's, 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 it's modulation, as you said. Well, and it, now notice that the modulation requires a, a, a dance between thought and feeling. It requires... Um, there's a theorist by the name of Alan Shore, and he says it requires a bi-hemispheric moment. And what that means is he sort of thinks about it in terms of left and right hemispheric processing, which is kind of controversial among, among uh, neuroscientists, but he embraces it. And there's this notion that there's a dance between thought and feeling. And it requires you to, to, to exercise those muscles. It requires you to, to think about them. And this may be something to talk about in a different podcast. Sure. I really like, I've been listening to a lot of, um, there's a, there's a, B, it's called Record Review on BBC, and it's where someone will, um, they'll take like um, um, Beethoven's Piano Trio, um, Opus 1, that was the first thing he ever did, and I think there are three, three trios that he did, and um, they'll talk about them, and they'll play different recordings and different interpretations of them, and talk about the ones they like best, and it's a piece of music that they're talking about in a way as if as if it has the sort of complexity that your own emotional states have. Okay. And so I like the idea of about thinking about music and listening to the world like it is a piece of music and being able to lean into it and think about it aesthetically. There's a there's a thing called the aesthetic turn in psychoanalytic thought. Okay. And that's where we begin to think about our own inner world um, the um, experiences we have with others and other people in a way like a work of art. We allow them that level of complexity so we can move in them and we can, we can name them and we can have that <clears throat> a level of, of complexity, complexity that borders on a controlled chaos. And then when we do that, we can move from, from envy um, to forgiveness of self to uh, uh, gratitude to an admiration of other and it requires a movement and it requires and it is in some ways the opposite of what happens when someone um, reflexively answers FOMO and maybe even when someone reflexively answers with JOMO that um, mm -hmm. if someone said to me that they had a joy of missing out because the moment they're in is beautiful and they're able to see the complexity and to be alive in that moment then that is true joy but my worry is if Joe Moment, Netflix, and chill, it may just simply be a retreat into a different medium as a way to titrate and regulate as opposed to modulate. Be my thought. No, I, um, I, think, I think you've got a, got a good point there. And I, I, I'm not sure um, where this comes from in, 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 in some way, the, the anxiety of not fitting in uh, or missing out on something. And is that part of some 
uh, I don't know, sort of narcissistic uh, trend toward that we have to be, um, and, and we're exposed to this on social media so much that we have to be the center of attention or we have to be uh, the model that we see out there on Instagram and all of those things. We have to sort of live up to these uh, unrealistic expectations and in some way we're telling ourselves we're failing if we if we don't live up to that and notice how what you're describing is really one of the it's ontological and not ontic it is it is part of the human condition all of us have that euthymic window that we move back and forth from and um it is it, it is not a flat line you know Freud's famous statement the only anxiety free state is death and when you were a cadaver you have neither fomo nor jomo you've got like i don't know Oh no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I don't know what you got. What you got but oh, well, we just introduced a new term. Yeah, that is, and that's fine. Uh, that's uh, absolutely fine. But, but uh. y- your your one of the ways to, to to define if there's such a thing as mental health is the capacity for um, for being able to answer that in a way that um, is um, is is for lack of a better word, allows you to stay alive. One of my favorite quotes from Donald Winnicott is it's a, a, his prayer, Lord, let me be alive when I die. And that we are so often pulled out of aliveness. We are made zombie yeah. in so many ways. All right, there's a lot to think about and the, mm-hmm. some of the things that you've talked about today. And, and I have to go back and listen to this because I think there's some topics that we need to go further Good, yes. that we brought up today. Steve so, Buscemi. Uh, uh, I was going to pass on that one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Steve Buscemi. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a great character right there. Yes, All right. Yes. So, um, yeah, so FOMO, uh, JOMO debunked. Or, 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 or may, maybe the way to think about that is, is that, um, and this is where I'm going to be Hegelian about it, that w- we offer an antithesis to this notion of FOMO and JOMO with the hope that we can generate um, a synthesis that moves us forward. I'm not sure why, but I think we might have been... <laughs> <laughs> we might have been disconnected what do you think? from the uh, internet. No, I think we're back. All right, okay. so uh, <laughs> what do I know? Anyway, that uh, there was a little disruption there. Does that sound like a storm or it some is. rain? Right is now it, it, is, it, is, it is storming badly. It okay. Sounds like, it sounds All right. like, uh, we're, well, we're, we're in a nice, uh, safe brick building. Uh, it's been I here hope since. I'm at the top of my car. I'm oh, you're my that hat. convertible now is a, your swimming pool, and yes. uh, you can put a chair next to that and read your book. <laughs> Uh, yes, by yes. the way, okay, so um, all right, any last thoughts about this? I mean, what, what would be your advice? Let's, uh, let's just get to that. So, we want to try to help some people maybe this? watching. So, life, what, what can we tell them? Life takes practice. I think that should be the basics takeaway that, that moments of joy and non joy and suffering, those are all at, at moments in which we can, we can be more alive. And if we go back to that statement that, um, that Beyond said, that we have to get better at suffering. And we may also need to be gather be, to get better at joy too. But it is practice. And one of the things that can, this happens in therapy, it's a place to practice. It's a place to be in a way that you normally wouldn't be. But you don't have to do this just in therapy. You can do this with friends and family. As long as you allow yourself to have a little, little level of self-reflection, the capacity to be able to lean into your experience in those moments and just sort of give them a name, to, to dance with them a little. Maybe that's something we can talk about more when we... It, it, this guy, Alan Shore, is really interesting in this notion of the euthymic window. That could be something to talk about, too. Yeah, the, uh, if, I, if I heard that right, mm-hmm. euthymic window is something that, that helps us regulate and modulate uh, mm-hmm. what's going on. We need to stay within that window. Is, well, that's a good window to be at. Well, you can think, of, and when we, we have a chance to talk about this, there's like this, like if you go to see a horror film, you're wanting that to bring you at the edge of your euthymic window. You want to be scared. So you, you literally, right. it's a controlled anxiety. Lots of folks can't deal with horror movies. So the euthymic no. window is a little narrow at the, at the top. Right. It's set lower down the, the you know, whereas some folks are, um, that's what they really enjoy. And well, so, it's a phenomenon. Mm-hmm. There are, and I know people we go to the show with on a regular basis, and they, oh, it's a horror movie. I'm not going, that's right, and yeah. that's it. They can't handle that, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas other people are kind of coming and having the best time of their lives. 
what's going on there? That might be well, another topic. Uh, this sounds like my day. wedding night. So I'm like <laughs> I, say. I have no doubt we'll hear more about that in the. Uh, I got a video too, to if you want to see. Yeah, no, please. <laughs> let's uh, keep all videos contained. Uh, Steve Buscemi's in it, by the way. I'm yeah, just listen, I don't, I don't <laughs> know about what happened there, but uh, the fact that you were married, that was, that's uh, <laughs> yes. one of those other phenomena. Really we're is. not sure. Well, let's just say that uh, you there, know that there are women out there whose expectations can be easily lowered. Let's <laughs> just say. Well, I'll, uh, yes, and I'll, uh, that might be a good place to end today. All right, Dr. Rose, thank you so much. Sweet. I'm going to call you Dan because you're uh, now on this new podcast coming out. We're going to put it Boom. around uh, and uh, continue to do this. Look forward to talking with you next on the next topic. Let's do it.